I'm going to press it now. Hello, everybody. Jacob Jans here with the Writer's Workshop at Authors Publish. Today, I'm pleased to present John Claude Bemis. He'll be giving a talk on everyday activities to improve your writing process with a focus on understanding how the brain functions so you can work with human nature as opposed to against it. This is part of our monthly lecture series where we present talks on the craft of writing or the business of publishing. John Claude Bemis, um, he's a new instructor for Authors Publish, specializing in teaching writing for young readers, picture books, chapter books, middle grade books, etc. John's books have been published by Penguin Random House and Disney Hyperion. Um, he's a former elementary school teacher who's transitioned to being a full-time writer, as well as teaching the occasional course for Authors Publish. So today, based on his extensive experience getting um, his extensive experience writing books that have been successfully published, um, John will be giving you ideas for improving the creative process so you can consistently produce high quality work while keeping in mind how the brain actually functions. You'll even learn why avoiding writing, sometimes called procrastination, can be beneficial to the writing process. So after the lecture, we'll have a short discussion. And for those watching live, I'll monitor the live chat to help guide the discussion and hopefully answer as many of your questions as we can. Um, so without further ado, welcome John Claude Bemis. Thank you so much, Jacob. Great to be with you today and great to be with everyone all around the world who is uh, joining us here today. So it's a real treat. This is a topic that I love getting to talk about. Um, you know, I'm kind of a process nerd and I'm always, when I get together with other writers or just other creatives, I always want to pick their brains on how they do what they do. And so this is, this is a fun talk for me um, because it gets at some of that. And it also has a lot of just very practical things that I think that you're gonna take away and ways of looking at your own process, your daily process of working on stories that is gonna, I think, gonna help you see it in a new light with some new possibilities. So, yeah. And I love the idea of focusing on process because process is such an, if, focusing on process is so empowering. Yes, it is. And, 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 I'm, and that's, you know, for me, you know, Talking, working with other artists, working with other creatives, that's such a big part of it is just helping people to not only to have the motivation or the drive, but just to be more effective at what we do as creatives and as writers. So, all right, I'm gonna dive into things here, my friends. So with Eric, this, uh, the title of this is Everyday Activities to Improve Your Writing. Let me go ahead and pull up um, my slides here that we're gonna follow. Now, to be honest with you, um, you know, uh, you, you hear some writers that say, I write every single day. I think that Stephen King kind of famously has that whole thing about how he writes every single day, even on, on his birthday. And um, I'll be honest, I, I don't write every single day, but I do work every single day. I do every single day, I find time to, to do something related to my story, to think about it, to have an activity around it, even if I'm not necessarily sitting down at the laptop or pulling out the notepad and pencil. And I think that it, an, an interesting analogy to look at is kind of like being an athlete or I'm a musician also, I play, uh, play a bunch of different instruments. Um, and you know, the, the idea of being in particular like an athlete or a musician is that to be effective, you know, that there are certain muscles that you need to develop, certain skills, certain exercises that you need to do that are going to optimize your performance. And this, and we can think of it the same way as writers as well. You know, being a writer, it's absolutely requires certain mental muscles and creative skills. And one of the things that we're going to look at today are, kind of, you know, some exercises of the imagination that can help you to be at peak performance when you do sit down to work and you do, you are working on your story. And as a way of starting that, just like if you're an athlete, it, is, it can be very helpful to understand what the body can do 
And so what we're going to look at first is as writers, what do we need to understand about the imagination, the brain, um, to better know what we can do. So looking at the brain, there has been this kind of traditional, you know, in, in kind of pop culture, the way we all sometimes the brain is thought about and talked about is, you know, we certainly have these two hemispheres, a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. But the way it's, it's often been defined is that left, the left hemisphere, that, that left side is more logic, right side is the creative side of the brain, you know, that, that, that's been the kind of classic thing that people have thought about with the brain. And it's not wrong, but there are, it's just a little more complicated than that as most things are. Um, because, you know, if you really think about it, I mean, as creative people, we use logic all the time. I mean, logic is an important part of being a writer. So it's not that logic doesn't go hand in hand with creativity. So, so what is a better way of looking at it? Um, I think that the more, the, the view that people often have today uh, of looking at the brain is, is to think about that the left part of your brain is a little more detail oriented. It, it handles some of you know, those specific tasks that you need to do, whereas the right brain can be more big picture organization and insights. If you were a bird, for example, the way that might work is you know, that, that, that left part of the brain is going to help you with the little detail things that you need to do, getting seeds from the bird feeder, picking up twigs to build the nest. But at the same time, the right side of the brain, the right hemisphere, it has an awareness of the environment to watch for predators. Okay, so both of those are working in conjunction with one another, even though they kind of have different, uh, different tasks, different way of working. And as writers, if you think about it, this is the way, you know, we see that at play with our work. When we are working on a story, there's a lot of important things that are going on in the left hemisphere, remembering who all our characters are, what we want to have happen specifically in a certain order in the particular scene that we are writing, some of the setting details that we have. Um, and then we have that right part of the brain that's holding the big picture. You know, think how, how, you know, as writers, how, how it's such an interesting challenge and it's phenomenal actually, how much we can hold in our brain at once, these kind of big picture ideas of our story. And when things are going well on a good day, um, as writers, you know, we're smart enough, we have enough mental flexibility that, that we're kind of are use, utilizing both left and right brain thinking. Um, you know, we can see the forest and we can see the trees. We can kind of do both. But what happens on those particular days when things don't go smoothly and you get stuck for an idea or you, you, you're just not sure what you want to have happen next? Maybe you've painted your character into a corner and you want to figure out what can I, you know, what can I do to get my character out of this particular situation? Well, Let's look to Archimedes for some guidance here. And you might remember the story of Archimedes, uh, the, the Eureka moment. It has some interesting insights to tell us about how left hemisphere and right hemisphere are working for us with ideas that are challenging, that are difficult, which we often run into as writers. Well, if you don't remember that story of Archimedes, okay, he, the king of Syracuse has, brings in Archimedes um, to help him because he's gotten a crown and he's not sure whether the crown is really pure gold or not. Um, he wants to make sure that he hasn't been ripped off here. And so Archimedes is his guy, his go-to guy to figure this thing out. So Archimedes, um, you know, he's a smart guy. And as you can see from this picture, I mean, he's got ripped abs also, you know, for a guy his age. So he's got a lot of things going for him. And so he starts doing a lot of the very logical things to think about to try to figure out whether the, the crown is gold. But they aren't actually all that useful because, I mean, he can't melt it. He can't damage the crown. So a lot of his initial ideas are not things that he, they're just not the right solution. And he grows frustrated. And what does he do? He goes back in his frustration. He takes a bath. As he sits down in the bathtub, the displacement of the water gives him the idea, the eureka moment of how he can figure out that he can use water displacement with, you know, the volume and figuring out mass, all that kind of stuff to figure out whether the crown is really gold. And he runs, as the story goes, runs naked through the streets of Syracuse, shouting eureka that he's got this solution. 
All right. So what's the takeaway from this? You know, it comes down to when do we really do our best thinking? You know, in moments when we are feeling frustrated, when we're feeling stressed, when we feel a lot of pressure, or in those moments when we might be a little more relaxed. You know, think about, I mean, do you do your best? Do you get your best ideas? Do your best thinking when you're stuck in rush hour traffic? No, probably not. You know, it's probably more likely on that relaxing drive somewhere. Um, do we get our best ideas when we're checking email on social media? No, definitely not. You know, it's, it's those moments when we're taking a bath, taking a shower, having a long, relaxing walk. Maybe when you are laying down at night and the lights go out, things are quiet, that those are those moments that your, your brain is often doing some of its most productive, creative thinking in terms of coming up with insights. Now, one, one of the things along those lines is to keep in mind that, sure, stress is, can be a creativity killer. And so this takeaway from our committees is when you are often, when you need an insight, when you're kind of stuck for a solution, stuck for an idea for, in your story, it can be good to do something relaxing, maybe get away from the laptop, maybe step away and go do something else. Ideally, something that is a kind of mindless physical activity, something that you can do without thinking too much. You know, this is why my, 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 my wife is thrilled that I'm the type of person around our house that I am very happy to fold laundry, very happy to wash dishes, run the vacuum cleaner, because that's a time that I, I find that that kind of mindless chore activity, something that's a little boring, is when I do some great thinking and I get some good insights about my story. Um, so the other thing that is interesting, we go back to that Archimedes story though, was not that he wasted his time with all the kind of logical left brain things at first. And it wasn't that getting to that point of frustration was a bad thing. In fact, that was a good thing in this process. And this is an important thing to understand about how your brain actually works when it is coming up with an interesting, creative, innovative solution. Naturally, the first thing we're gonna go to are the more logical possibilities for a particular situation. And sometimes that left brain logic is exactly the thing to produce the idea that you need. You've painted that character in a story, you're looking for a good line of dialogue, and you kind of think logically about it and you get a, a great idea. But sometimes we don't, you know, sometimes we're, we just sense that this is not the right solution. And I cannot figure out how I want my story to end or how I want this chapter to end or what I want this character to, to do to gather this cl important clue that this character needs in the story. And we might get to that point of frustration. That's okay. You know, you need to feel okay that you have gotten to that point of frustration because from a neurological standpoint, one of the interesting things is that frustration actually goes hand in hand with the shifting of the, the, the duties, if you will, of going from left brain to right brain. That process of kind of moving things away from the logical left brain, looking at those, those, those kind of uh, possibilities, to letting the brain operate in a bigger, larger, looking at big picture kind of things to draw on unusual possibilities that might come into place often happens after we hit that point of frustration. But after we hit that point of frustration, and then we do something to relax. Obviously, if you stay frustrated and you stay stressed and you're banging your head against the wall, you're probably not gonna get the solution. So if in that moment you do that relaxing activity, that is often going to encourage you to have that big insight, to have better ideas, more interesting, more novel, innovative ideas and possibilities for what is the, what is, what is the right, an interesting idea, thing to do in that particular scene. Now, one other thing that I wanna say about the brain that I think is helpful um, in what we do in just understanding how it works, because we do need both 
left brain and right brain kind of function. They, they both work together uh, and they're both very helpful at times. And when you need to, to, to activate more of that left brain, that task oriented kind of productivity, which is often that the part of the brain that is kicked in when you are, you know what the scene needs to be. You just need to put your butt in the chair and just start cranking out, get some words on the page. You just need to be very productive. Caffeine and a stimulant like that is perfect for those kind of activities. They activate that left part of the brain. They, can't, they help you stay productive. But if you're in a position where you need to just think about bigger ideas, you might need to synthesize different possibilities, different aspects of your story, pull them together. You know, when you're trying to hold those big picture kind of things in your head and think through it, then it's actually best to avoid caffeine in those situations because the right side of the brain um, operates a little better when it is quiet, when it is calmer. We see this every night, you know, when we go to bed, you know, the way that when we're in those quiet moments at bed, or often we wake up from a dream, or often we go to bed not knowing the answer to a problem, and then somehow in the morning we wake up and it's been solved. Because that right side of the brain is quite active at night, left side of the brain has been shut down. And one of the things, if, if any of you have watched the TV show um, that came out last fall called The Queen's Gambit, there was actually, this was actually illustrated in, an, in a fascinating way in that TV show. In The Queen's Gambit, for those of you that haven't seen it, she is a world champion uh, chess player. And as a child, she got addicted to tranquilizers you know, this drug, and she would hoard them in the orphanage where she was. And when, and often at night, she would take a lot of these tranquilizers, which are a sedative. And in the movie, they, I mean, in the TV series, they show her when she takes the tranquilizers, often visualizing all these different plays of, of, of chess, because chess is very right brain in how you have to, you have to take in a lot of information at once and make a lot of unusual connections and get these kind of insights. And in that same show, she actually has a, a match where she gets to, not, not a formal match, but she just gets together with another world champion chess player and they're playing for fun, but she's been drinking all this coffee and she's all like wound up from it and she keeps ruining all her games. And, and here's, here's part of that, that reasoning that goes into play, which is understanding when you need to be more left brain task oriented, when you need to be more right brain, big picture, gathering insights and putting them together. So being a writer requires this kind of mental flexibility and being able to shift between different modes of thinking are gonna be incredibly helpful for you. When you're working on that first draft, first draft of something and you really just need to write, you just need to get words on the page, you need to start cranking it out. That's when we're being that dedicated worker you know, that, um, you know, where we need to be a little more left brain. And then there are obviously times when we need to be more of the, the daydreamer, the possibilities. What could this be? You know, let your mind wander to different and unusual places. Just like we often also, this is something I think a lot of us struggle with as a writer, is the mental flexibility to shift between when to be critical of our own work and when not to be critical. Obviously, there are times in the writing process that we do need to be quite critical. We need to be judgmental of our own work, especially when we're doing revisions and we're, we're, we're rereading and we're thinking about how we can make this better and what may or may not be working in the story. But as you have, I'm sure you have, you have seen and sensed and had this experience of, but you don't need that critical side to be on when you're trying to get down a first draft. You need to be more uninhibited. You need to be uh, that, that, that wild explorer who can just, um, who, who's not being held back by that overly critical part of the brain. So one thing every day as, as a writer to think about is the modes of thinking when your brain is at its best, when you are going to be the most productive and what kind of role you need to take on in that particular moment to get the best, get your best ideas. So let's look at some specific activities, some things that you can do uh, on a daily basis, 
maybe when you're writing, maybe when you're having a writing day, some of these are going to be very helpful for you for that. Some of these are going to be also helpful for those days that you honestly just don't have time to do uh, to do some writing. That, and even when you have a day like that, maybe you're on a car ride to the grocery store. Um, may, that can be a time just to think. It can be a time to play around with some of these different activities that I'm going to show you today to see what new ideas it brings into play into your story. Because as we know very well as writers, I mean, write, even though we're called writers, you know, we take that verb, really an important part of our job is not just the writing, it's the thinking. As writers, we need to be good thinkers. And, and I find also that even if I'm not, you know, if, if I'm about to go on vacation for a week or, or I just know it's a time in life when, when, uh, when personal family things might, might take precedent and I'm just not able to get as much of my writing done, or maybe it's just professional things that you just know that you're not gonna be able to sit down at the laptop and get a lot of, get much written on your story. That I still find it's important to keep those stories in the foremost of those of my thoughts, to continue thinking about them on a daily basis. And we have to be often quite dedicated in making that choice on a daily basis of finding the time, carving out that little bit of time that we can just think. So here's some things that you can do in, in, uh, in whether you're writing, whether you're just thinking about your story. One of them is this rule of six. All right, now this is, this is more advice for you as you're, you're thinking about possibilities for a story. But with the rule of six, that now six is an incredibly strong, in nature, six is a very strong shape. You know, the, the, the honeybee, the, any sort of, you know, the, where we have these kind of hives that are built in hexagons. Hexagons are stronger than circles. They're stronger than triangles. They're stronger than squares. So six is strong. And when I'm working on coming up with an idea, whether it's the name of a character or I want a great last line in my chapter, something that really has punch, or one character says something and I want a good response from the other character, what would be that thing that would be just the most interesting thing to say in this particular moment as a response to what this other character said? I often, I, I don't stop with my first idea. And I know a lot of you are probably in the same boat because uh, I've as I've been talking to a lot of the, the, my students in my class that I'm teaching at the moment, we've, they've been often mentioning how that, that they, yeah, they, they tend to try to come up with at least two or three ideas at first. Great. If you're doing two, three ideas, then that's better than stop starting, stopping with your first idea. But I urge you to try to find six possibilities because two or three are often going to be those first kind of left brain ideas that you're, that you're, imagination is going to spit out. And sometimes to get to that fourth idea, that fifth idea, to really stretch it to a sixth possibility can be quite hard. It can be quite challenging. And in fact, this, is, this kind of plays into what um, Jacob had mentioned at the beginning a little bit with procrastination. This can be another reason why sometimes procrastination is a helpful function in that if you, when, when I have that, I often, when I'm trying to work out a possibility for something like this, I might start to jot them down. I might jot down the first idea that I get on a sticky note, on a, on a dry erase board in a notebook. I have flip charts in my office and I'll sometimes put them on. And I might only be able to get to three or four possibilities. And I just cannot think of another one. And then I'll walk away from it. I'll leave it up. And, I'll, and as I come back later, I pass through the room and I look at it again. I might think about it a little bit but then just give it more time, depending on how important it is in your story. If it's something that you really want, a powerful idea, then by not rushing the process, by giving that time to bake, to give that right side of your brain a lot of time to pull in unusual other possibilities into the solution, to synthesize more information, you might come up with something really great. And this is why a lot of the research on procrastinators is that they are actually a little they're often better at times in coming up with uh, unusual solutions because they spent more time thinking about it, in fact. So, um, so rule six, try it out. Um, another one is thinking about just ideas in general, that we, 
I, you know, we, we sometimes hear people, I, I know that none of you have said this, but maybe people who are, are a little more amateur than us in their creative fields use the excuse that, oh, well, I'm not going to bother. All the best ideas have already been used. And we know that's not true, right? That the best, there, there is no end to ideas. Um, ideas are not a limited resource like fresh water or fossil fuels. Ideas are unlimited. And the reason is that whenever we want to come up with something new, something novel, something innovative, it's often just taking existing ideas and combining them in ways that they haven't, that we haven't seen before. This book, The Nine Pound Hammer, was uh, the first book that, uh, not the first book I ever wrote, but the first book I ever wrote that I also got published. And The Nine Pound Hammer, uh, I know, I, I feel very certain that a big reason that this was that first book that I was able to sell to an agent, and that agent was able to sell to an editor at Random House, was because it had an unusual combination within the story. It was something that that was was not something that that my, this agent and editor had really seen before. And with the Nine Pound Hammer, it's a fantasy adventure, but rather than a traditional kind of fantasy adventure that has maybe elves and knights and castles and dragons and medieval European kind of things, this was a story that, as someone who is American, who grew up in the American South, um, had always been very fascinated with Southern folklore, American folklore from the American South, our American legends and tall tales, our American history. I thought it would be quite interesting to try to write a fantasy epic that drew on these very American bits of folklore and legend. So that combination there, that combining American history and legend with fantasy adventure was that unusual combination that I think helped that book to really stand out um, to agents and editors. We see, you know, that th this kind of thinking is what we might think of as lateral thinking, as opposed to linear thinking. Linear thinking, you know, where we kind of take the obvious path of connecting things that seem like they already fit together. Lateral thinking is when we create something new, something original, innovative by combining things that, that, that don't seem like they necessarily fit together. Something very unusual. I mean, you, I remember when I was working on that book, The Nine Pound Hammer, and I was trying to combine those, some of those unusual aspects. And I remember in the early drafts where I was thinking, maybe this is a stupid idea, you know, that, that trying to have a book with both American cowboys in it and magic, cowboys and magic. Is that a stupid idea? And, but I stuck with it and I kept playing with it until I was able to make it come together in a way that I felt very satisfied with. And I think that a lot of readers were very satisfied with it. But when we first get those ideas, when we first get that combination of wanting to put two things together, sometimes it seems ridiculous. It seems stupid. Like I remember back in 2007 thinking, you know, if that when the, the iPhone was just getting announced and we, were, we had this whole kind of, uh, you know, that we're going to take your cell phone, this phone that, that your little flip phone that you have, but we're going to put a computer in it. And I thought that was a stupid idea. I was thinking, I'm never going to buy one of these things. All right. Obviously, I was completely wrong on that one. And that's the way a lot of these ideas come about. At first, they seem very unusual. The, the unusual combination of the iPhone, the brilliant combination of peanut butter and chocolate in the Reese's peanut butter cup, the greatest dessert of all time, in my uh, humble opinion. I, I, but we, we see it also in writing. We had this, um, we have a writer from North Carolina where I live named Charles Fraser, who wrote this book, Cold Mountain. And he combined two very unusual ideas that are at the heart of that book, which is a book where the story and the characters are, are, are based on the Odyssey by Homer, someone coming back from war and having this twisting, turning path all the way back home to his, the, the woman that he loves. 
But he combined that, that narrative structure with the American Civil War, you know, that it's, it's, a, it's a Civil War soldier who's kind of in the shoes of Odysseus. And that unusual combination was helped to make Cold Mountain such an, an interesting and original book. Now, when we are going to use this in our daily practice, sometimes it might be that idea, that big idea that you have for your story, one of the initial ideas that you have. Um, maybe you're in the early phases of that new idea for a story and you're, and you're thinking, okay, what can I do to maybe to make, I have the story that I want to write that is a murder mystery, but how can I make it unusual, something that readers haven't seen before? What are some things that I can add into that story that will help it stand out in the marketplace, help it stand out to agents and editors as well as readers? So sometimes it's those big ideas uh, lateral thinking that can be important, but sometimes it works on the smaller, more daily level of writing a particular scene, of working out ideas for a character. So let's look at a few of those. Like if we're working with a particular character, lateral thinking can come into play when you kind of maybe think of what, what is the archetype that your character fits? Maybe your character even kind of fits the role of a particular trope. You know, whether it's a detective, whether it's um, a bully, whether it's a victim, whether it's uh, the wise guide, whatever that, the love interest, whatever that kind of trope might be. But to keep it from be becoming a trope, because we've all seen a lot of stories that have the unhappy spouse, you know. So what could we do that would be an unusual thing to, to add to that particular character? You know, not going for the linear, obvious things that might surround what we often think of with a happy spouse. Maybe this, I mean, unhappy spouse. Maybe this unhappy spouse is, um, becomes a drug dealer. Maybe they become an arms dealer. Yeah. Or maybe this unhappy spouse one day goes to a, uh, um, you know, passes by where someone's having a, a, a yard sale and they're getting rid of a metal detector and they buy a metal detector. Now that's a kind of unusual combination, that unhappy spouse, the metal detector. How do these two things even fit together? At first, it, it seems odd and weird and just unnecessarily bizarre. But by trying to think of how to put those two things together, by, by getting your brain to spend some time daydreaming and imagining about possibilities for what this unusual connection might mean, can generate some, some quite interesting ideas that will be surprising and I think innovative to your reader as well. We also see it on the line level, just in our actual writing and our word choice. I mean, at the heart of, of any great metaphor is almost always this kind of thinking, this lateral thinking, this combining unusual, unexpected ideas together. You know, a line like from John Green, my thoughts are stars, I cannot fathom into constellations, you know, that, that taking, comparing one's thoughts to the night sky, that's a kind of, that's very unusual. And it, and it gives it a nice effect for the reader because it's surprising. It, 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 it pops when we try to put things together in unusual ways. You know, Emily, Emily Dickinson's wonderful line, you know, dying is a wild night and a new road. It's such an unusual word combination there to compare dying with a wild night. They feel so different from one another, but that's exactly what, what gives them weight, which gives them uh, you know, interest to our readers. So when we're in that moment of trying to come up with a great metaphor, come up with a great description, think of unusual combinations. Don't go for the, the most, you know, first you might think of some logical ones, but then after you get through some of the logical ones, push yourself in that rule of six to trying to come up with some more unusual ones as you go. Um, there was, you know, an, another way that this kind of worked out for me as I was working on the nine pound hammer was I have this particular character in the story uh, named Hobnob. And Hobnob, he's just a minor character, but my but the way he was supposed to work in the story was my young hero, uh, this boy Ray, is lost in the woods and he encounters Hobnob tied up to a tree. Now Hobnob is, he's good at heart, but he is kind of an outlaw character. He's a bit of a scoundrel. And, but he convinces Ray to help untie him, to free him from where he's been tied up out in the forest. 
And then I knew that I wanted Hobnob to be the first introduction to my main character, Ray, that, that there was magic in the world. And what I wanted Hobnob to do was to be able to disappear in this moment. Once he had been freed, that he would disappear. So what, did, what did I, was I going to do? How was he? Was he just going to vanish? Was he going to fly away? Those were kind of the, the obvious choices in a way. Um, and so I, I went to those kind of examples first, but that just knew they weren't right, that, I, that there was a better idea out there. And this was such an important scene that I wanted it to be memorable. I wanted it to be surprising to my reader. You know, having that moment of surprise can be just so delightful for the reader that it can commit them to wanting to see more, to see what more surprises are to come. And so on that particular day, I remember I, I couldn't come up with a, a good answer. And I had kind of heard the, the, the mail getting dropped off in my mailbox. And I thought, I'm just going to step away. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to walk out to the curb and, and pick up the mail, uh, clear my head a little bit. And as I was walking out, you know, it was that time in, in North Carolina where I live, where we have a lot of, in the summer, where there's a lot of dandelions in our yards. And if you haven't seen dandelions, you know, they, these yellow flowers, and then they fade into these, these kind of white um, balls like this that you can, if you kick them, then they kind of disperse these little seed pots. And as I was walking out to the mailbox, passing by these dandelions, I was kind of kicking them with my foot. And as I watched those pods float off into the breeze, that idea was there, you know, that that's what Hobnob was gonna do. He was going to have a dandelion hat. And if he could, put, once he puts the hat on his head, he and the hat, his body would dissolve into dandelion petals. And that's how he would, he would disappear and vanish. So a lot of times the, the takeaway from this is that trying this unusual combinations, of course, works well. But also that ideas, the, the, the inspiration for a solution is all around us. You never know where you're going to get that. You're going to make that unusual connection. But by by holding off on finding the answer, holding off on committing to it, procrastinating a bit before you commit to the solution and letting, feeling a little bit of frustration that you can't find it and you're thinking about it a lot will direct your mind in a way that it will be looking for possibilities, for things that will ignite a solution. And they will often come from the most unexpected places around you. The random thing that someone says, the, the song that comes on the radio, uh, that that line that you happen to read in your book at night when you're going to bed, you just never know. But another thing that I like to do is to gather inspiration in a way. When I see something that activates my imagination, that I know that I'm drawn to, I, I, I gather them into these lists that I like to write down. And I will often collect them in, I have these, I know that a lot of you are probably the type that when you get an idea, you might put it into your phone, you know, type it in as a note or maybe uh, a voicemail. I'm still kind of old school. I like to carry around a back pocket notebook. Um, and so I, I often carry my notebook, these notebooks with me everywhere I go, because you just never know when you'll overhear something or you'll see something. And I, I like to jot them down in my little back pocket notebook. Um, and then I like to come back and think about it more. So when I'm out on that walk or I'm folding laundry, that I think, I'm thinking about these other things sometimes that are not necessarily related to my stories and doing a little bit of that playful daydreaming about it, whether it's hearing. I remember I just heard this story on uh, public radio about how Leonardo da Vinci had designed this suit of armor that he wanted to build and put gears and spring work and make it kind of a wind up toy in a way, but it was going to be a suit of armor. And I just thought about that for days and kicked that idea around in my head. Um, and eventually was, because, was part of what led me to write a book called The Wooden Prince, which is a reimagining of the Pinocchio story. But these kind of things that I put in my list, this is my list. Yours is going to be completely different. And the, the, the more unusual uh, the in, and varied the interests are that you have, the more possibilities it'll bring for interesting ideas into your stories. These are the kind of things that, because they are your particular, the, the things that you find that you are curious about, that 
no, you are not going to, your list is not going to be like mine, but your list is not going to be like anybody else's in the world because of the combination of various things that fascinate you. And maybe we use these lists. They can be a good place to go back to when you are stuck for that idea. And maybe looking at something like Raised by Wolves will just spark that interesting idea for you uh, to help find a solution in your story, even if your story has nothing to do with wolves or feral children. You never know how uh, it might spark because of that emotional connection that your curiosity and your imagination has with that element. And these can also be unusual to try to combine with one another as well. You know, the, um, to, to look at the, the, how these adjacent ideas might fit with one another. The raised by wolves with artificial intelligence with a deeper humanity. At first, those don't seem like they go together at all, but wouldn't that be an interesting story? A, or a robot with a deep sense of humanity who's raised by wolves, you know, that, that could be a cool story. Or you, you overhear someone talking about something or you just have a particular curiosity like tarot cards. I remember I, I saw the word quietus and I just got interested in it and looked up the, the origin of the word. And, and sometimes just in that research that you might do, whether it's on a word origin or on uh, the history of something like tarot cards, that the process of looking doing a little bit of the research brings new ideas into your imagination, new possibilities that, that might, you might be able to add into your story um, in interesting and unusual ways. Um, another thing, of course, that, that I think many of us do is the asking what if questions. You know, if we are working on our story and we, get to, we hit that little pause in our daily activity where we're not sure what to have happen next, a lot of us do this already. We start to think, hmm, what should I do? What if I tried this? What if I tried that? And what if can, is such a powerful question that because it does not lead us to one particular answer. There's no one right solution. You know, if, if we were just uh, daydreaming a little bit as part of our daily practice, taking a walk, exercising the imagination in that way, and we wanted to play with this idea of what if someone burned all their possessions? Well, there's no one right answer to that. And in fact, if we ask different people, they will have, think of different possibilities. But for you, what are the possibilities that would fascinate you with that question? And as you're spending that little bit of time daydreaming, playing with that idea in your imagination, exercising that part of the creativity, Try the rule six. See if you can come up with six possible things that, you know, like that might happen if to a character, if they burned all their possessions or if they, uh, the reasons that led to it. What if we, could we think of six possible reasons that would lead a character to want to do this? But this kind of play, even if it's not directly related to your story, on a daily practice of playing with some of these ideas, you never know when they will, it will ignite something that might be an interesting idea to bring into your story or to create a certain line of dialogue or to add some, an interesting aspect to a character's personality. So these kind of, uh, you know, what if questions are, are such a nice way, again, of playing, of exercising. And, you know, just like, the athlete that might not run a race every day or go play a particular sports match, but they often could be at peak performance are going to be exercising the certain muscles and skills. I urge you to make time as well to ask your what if questions, to play with those unusual lateral combinations, um, to work on lists of, of these things that fascinate you. Um, which I like to call magnetic nouns, by the way, because these are the things, the lists of things that, like a magnet, your imagination is drawn to. The more we play with those kind of things, the, the, the stronger our imaginations and our creativity will be, and the better our ideas will be for our particular stories. Um, and even though I've kind of used this idea of the athlete as, uh, as a metaphor for us as writers, I want to kind of end on a slightly different metaphor here, which is that to think about our, our role um, as writers and, and the way that that might be kind of childlike. 
being in the role of a child. This is this, by the way, is John Claude Bemis dressed up as Zorro uh, and sometime in the early 70s, um, you know, doing some imaginative play. Because remember why you probably got into writing in the first place. Most likely, it was fun. It was something you enjoyed. As adults, we don't do the same kind of play that we did when we were kids, but we have other ways that we like to play. Playing with ideas, dreaming up these imaginary characters and situations, writing them into stories. And to be better as writers, it can be helpful to take a few tips from children, the way they approach creativity on a daily basis. You know, they, they, they play, approaching your writing with a sense of play. Uh, looking at your writing um, and the ideas that you want to draw into it with a sense of curiosity, you know, that you want to explore different things. As adults, what often happens is that we often become experts at certain things. We've become very knowledgeable about certain things and not as knowledgeable about others. And so we, we sometimes then like to hold on a little tighter to those, those areas that we have a little more expertise in. But as a creative person, it can be more, better sometimes to be like the child who is not an expert, who has that beginner's mind, as they, all, they sometimes say in, in Buddhism, where you, you, you don't consider yourself an expert. And so you're more curious. You want to draw, take in, soak in more information. And to not be so focused on the outcome, on achievement, you know, it can be so easy for us as writers, and I'm just as guilty of it as anybody, of when I'm working on a story of just being, having so much of my thoughts preoccupied with the outcome, with whether it will get published, what people will think of it, um, of just getting a draft finished, or when will I get to revision, that sometimes that can overwhelm uh, the process so that we sometimes forget the joy, the pleasure, the everyday fun that comes from working on our stories. And if we approach that writing on a daily practice, like a child with a bit of play, get weird, get silly, ask what if questions, ask why, why does that happen? Why does that have to happen in the story? Why couldn't this happen in the story? All those kind of things that are very childlike in the way um, of thinking um, can, can help spark some innovation, new ideas, and help you to become a stronger writer and creative thinker. I appreciate you being here as part of this lecture. And just to, to quickly, just to say that if you are curious about what I write, my books, um, I tend to write, yes, for young readers, novels, that is, and a lot of them are kind of magical in nature, although I have written a picture book about some time that I spent in East Africa and Rwanda. Um, the, if you, you can find out more at my website, johnclawbemis.com and on social media also, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, and I have some other little YouTube, shorter YouTube videos that, that I've, I've put up just about some of these specific activities that we've done in this particular lecture today. So you might enjoy checking that out. So. Uh, thank you, John, so much for the, that lecture. Um, my head is just full of ideas and thoughts right now. Um, would, would you mind spending a minute talking about how when you're going through ideas, like say you want to write a novel, how do you know when you find, how do you know when you finally settled onto that unusual combination that's worth pursuing? Yeah, because it can be a tricky thing. I mean, certainly... Yeah. You, just by combining two unusual things together is not going to generate a great idea right away. Um, sometimes, they, you know, just because it's a weird combination doesn't mean that it's, it's a good combination. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that what makes it work is often the way we finesse those unusual ideas, what we actually do with them, and the way that we make it work for our particular vision for what we want the story to be. So a lot of times in those moments, I find that it is kind of trusting your own instincts that I think that we can often sense relatively quickly whether something is a good idea to pursue or not. That sometimes we have this kind of instinctive sense that, nah, this is not a good combination. But then we, yeah. we hit on something like when I had that Cowboys and Magic that I was like, this might be a really stupid idea, but I can sense that there's a possibility there, at least for me. 
I'm interested in exploring that more. And so if, if you have that particular interest in wanting to, to take it further, explore it more, um, then it's probably a sign that you will ultimately be able to find the right way to bring those particular ideas together. Okay. So like with, with the nine pound hammer book, did you come up with the idea and then just immediately start writing the novel or did you do like, how did you, how did you no. make the decision for that book? Yeah. So it, it, it did start from a place of, of, of wanting to write the book that I wanted to read. You know, yeah. I, yeah. I had read a lot of uh, fantasy novels over the years. I've read all those Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and um, all that, uh, just so many. But I often had been thinking that, you know, the book that I think would be really interesting to, to read would be one that, you know, had this, a lot of this American folklore and legend and, and just didn't see it. Um, so that was kind of the premise that I'd set up for myself at first, before I knew who the characters were, before I wanted the story. And then I just started playing with different possibilities. A lot of it is imaginative play, the mm -hmm. early stages of an idea. Do I want to set this story in contemporary America? And then I think through possibilities and spend a lot of time daydreaming on that. Um, and ultimately, I settled on setting it in the late 19th century. But it took it, it, it. I spend a lot of time just letting ideas bake before I sit down and write. Mm -hmm. And I like to also let the ideas bake to a point where I'm starting. I'm, I'm developing the characters. I'm starting to think through in my mind what I want the story to ultimately be. And um, so it becomes a little bit of that out. I, I am a little more of an outliner than a discovery writer in okay. that sense of I like to spend so much time just thinking about the story before I sit down and start the first draft mm -hmm. that often I am at a place that I've, I've kind of settled on what I think I want the arc of the story to be from beginning to end. I might not know every little thing, but I, I often am feeling confident that there is an actual story there because yeah. yeah. the comp arc to it. So you, you, you spend that time doing that thinking when you're washing the dishes or folding the laundry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're taking long walks. Yeah. I mean, some of, you know, this was the thing that, that took a little while for my wife to believe that, you know, when I was like, I'm going to go take a two hour hike back at the state park, bring my little back pocket notebook with me. Yeah. And it's like, I'm actually, this is work time. This is actually yeah. work time. Um, because a lot of times those long walks, give me the opportunity to think very deeply. The activity of walking, you know, there's this great um, uh, Salvador and Belanda. I can't remember what the Latin expression is, but there's some sort of Latin expression that's basically to think, you know, to solve by walking, you know, and that there's, there's a great tradition of that kind of thing. Yeah. So. It seems to me that there are certain activities that are really conducive to that type of thinking where you're thinking deeply about an activity and also not thinking intentionally at all. And right. it seems to me those are generally activities that have just like a little bit of physical activity involved, like folding laundry or going on a walk, but not activities like look, looking at Facebook on your cell phone yeah. <laughs> or yeah. flipping exactly. through a magazine. Like there's a, there's a certain type of activity that is much better for this than other types of activities. And I think that one of the keys to that is that a lot of times those activities are things that we might traditionally think of as boring. I mean, for a lot of us, we do walks, but you know, you, mm -hmm. you, you tell a kid that you're going to go walk around for a while, you know, that for a lot of kids that they might find that quite boring, mm -hmm. but boredom is an important part of being a creative person because, and this is one of the, I actually just saw an article recently that was in a business journal that was saying that people that they've noticed that there's kind of a, in the United States, at least, that there's this, we use this Torrance creativity test that's kind of used sometimes to, to measure creativity. And mm -hmm. a lot of people are scoring lower now and that they yeah. think that uh, what's going on there is just, you know, the cell phone. Just the yeah. fact that when we're bored, the first thing we often do is we try to end that boredom by getting entertained by flipping through social media. Um, you know, obviously adults and kids can both be guilty of this. But to, to allow ourselves to be bored, to allow ourselves when we're in the car on a long car ride, um, to not cut on the radio, to not cut mm -hmm. on the podcast or to, to just sit there with the quiet yeah. um, 
is when we often, our brain often gets to a place of being more creative and doing deeper thinking. I think that's such a big deal in today's culture. I know like in my own life, there are so many opportunities all the time just to have input, constant input, whether from the computer or my phone or just things around me taking up that mental space where if you're constantly taking in ideas from other people, how are you gonna be generating your own ideas, right? Right, that's right. I think it's incredibly important for all of us as writers and creatives to to give ourselves time to be bored regularly. So, Um, back to something you said earlier, where when you you decided with the nine pound hammer you wanted to write the book you wanted to read, I thought that was such a really good point because that shows first that you've read a lot of books, um, right? You you, so you know the genre, you know what what's out there, and and then you're also aware of what works and what doesn't work and what's not there. So there was a book that I'm sure is very similar to many of the books you read that you wanted to write, but you had your own unique angle on it, right? Right. So I wanted and to... Yeah. And, 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 and the truth is, like, even if you don't have that completely original idea, you're going to bring something unusual mm-hmm. to it that another writer isn't. I mean, the, the, one of the other books that I wrote, The Wooden Prince, is, is the Pinocchio story. And obviously, I didn't mm-hmm. come up with the Pinocchio story. No. Neither did Disney. You know, Carlo Collati, and, you know, it's an Italian story first. Um, and so sometimes taking an old fairy tale or taking another story, like I mentioned, the cold mountain, taking the, the, the odyssey and reimagining an older story, a traditional story. If we all took on a particular story like that and retold it, probably all of us would tell it in a slightly different way because it draws from our imaginations, the things that, that are our particular passions, our particular interests, mm-hmm. our way of, of doing it and telling that story and what's important to us. Um, that would be different from others. Yeah. I think that that readers, especially regular readers, really want a sense of familiarity with their stories, but also like they don't want to just read what they've read before. Right. I think that's true. Like they want like that combination of the usual and the unusual. Absolutely. You know, and we and it's, you know, it's why, um, you know, for, for folks who like reading mystery stories or like reading romance stories that there's there is something nice about the particular patterns that we, we see, the familiar patterns that we often see mm-hmm. in those stories. Um, but then it's also so fun when we see one of those tropes or one of those yeah. things that we were so, so used to seeing get overturned. Mm-hmm. Get flipped. Yeah. 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 Like mystery. That's a good example because a good mystery story, you're guessing the whole time. But in order to have good guesses, it has to follow like certain standards of the genre but it can't just be that or you'll be bored, right? If, if your right. guesses are always correct, then <laughs> it's, not, right. it's not a good story. Um, so yeah, that's a good example of the genre. Um, I was also thinking about how like, there's so many different levels of using this idea of unusual combinations. Like you talked about bringing it down to the, just the line or like a single metaphor in a story. And also, like, it could be the whole concept for the book. Right. Um, yeah. Do you have any, any thoughts about that? Like how you. No, I mean, I, I think that that the reason I try to bring that up is because a lot of a lot of us do it already. And, mm-hmm. and just by bringing some awareness to that. Oh, yeah. That particular idea that I'm drawn to in my, in my story or that funny name that I have for a character. Um, is because of that surprising combination. You know, the reaction that we have to the surprise of it is, is what makes it compelling. And mm-hmm. so when we get in the habit of, of trying to intentionally use it in our stories, you know, because I think a lot of us have, have, have come up with great ideas that we now realize, oh yeah, that's lateral thinking. That's that kind of unusual combination. Yeah. But when we're intentional about it in trying to solve particular problems, then, um, it can just be such so helpful on a daily practice. Like you said, everything from the big picture idea to just like the Mac, the micro level of a line name of a character, piece of dialogue, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, I would love to just keep talking to you about this because I I feel like we could go back and forth for a long time, but we're out of time for today. Um, I want to thank everybody for 
being here and for listening to the lecture. Um, John, is there anything you want to say? No, thank you. We'll do it again. So we'll, we'll pick up on some other topics. So yeah, that'll be great. great uh, so I encourage everyone to look up John Claude Bemis. I'm sure if you Google his name, you'll find his website um, and buy his books. And also, if you have any questions for me about um, our courses or Authors Publish, you can send an email to support at authorspublish.com. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Jacob. It was great. Yeah, thank you, John.